The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Again Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, into the district of the Decapolis. And people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him off by himself, away from the crowd. He put his finger into the man's ears and spitting, touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and groaned and said to him, Ephapheta, that is, be opened. And immediately the man's ears were opened. His speech impediment was removed, and he spoke plainly. He ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they proclaimed it. They were exceedingly astonished, and they said, He has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, good morning once again. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I barely have my feet on the ground because I came back from Ireland yesterday. It was supposed to be yesterday. It ended up, you know, flying, being what it is. I didn't end up where I wanted to end up and when I wanted to end up. Um, much, I ended up much later and in a place I hadn't planned on going to, namely New York. I was, heading, I was headed for Newark. Um, but here we are, anyway. Uh, the reason why I was in Ireland was because, primarily, um, because my brother is very sick, he has cancer, and um, a very serious form of it. Um, so I wanted to spend time with him and see him and, and uh, uh, pray over him and anoint him and so on and so forth. So uh, say a little prayer for him, if you would, uh, sometime uh, today, maybe before you leave church. Um, that God's healing power may come into him and that uh, the treatment that he's receiving may become uh, efficacious and, and, and bring him back to health. Um, there's just a, a, a slight possibility of that happening. But it was probably a good time anyway for me to go away um, because um, I'm beginning my 50th year in, in the priesthood. Um, and w one thing about that is, those of you who have, are my age, no, you don't deal with stress and anxiety uh, as easily and as well. I never worried about stress when I was younger. It never it wasn't a part of me, really. Um, but I find it, it is as I get older. And of course, with all that has been going on in the church, you know, as I begin my 50th year in the priesthood, it's very depressing. It's very depressing for everybody. We're kind of all in this together. Uh, we're all struggling um, with what's happening, what's go going on. And, and I know I, I'm, I'm filled with all kinds of emotions, including fear. You know, fear of what we're going to hear next. Uh, that, that, that's a part of it. And um, I have to say, um, I, I'm, I'm a little more sorted out now in my own mind, but uh, when I left 10 days ago, I wasn't. Uh, uh, I was kind of pretty convoluted. But, so it gave me an opportunity to think and to pray and to read, too, uh, about what's happening and what's going on. And um, I, I was reminded uh, on the plane coming back last night of a, a talk I gave to the students at St. Catherine's School sometime last year or the year before, um, having to do with um, dealing with difficult stuff. You know, and I was talking to them about the phenomenon that long distance runners sometimes talk about, uh, namely when they hit the wall. They talk about that, I understand. I'm not a long distance runner, but I know they talk about you hit the wall. You know, you start off and you're full of enthusiasm, excitement, and energy. Um, and after a while, um, uh, something happens to you. Um, something that is very difficult. Uh, and it's, it's the time when many runners trade in their running shoes for the remote control. Um, and they kind of back away um, and they pack it in. Um, it's that moment like when your whole system and your muscles 
and your mind seems to rebel against you, against what you're doing, um, and, and sort of challenges you uh, to give up, to walk away. Um, but of course, the real runners, the marathoners, don't give in to that temptation. They continue on. Um, sometimes they close their eyes um, and they set their eyes on the, f on, on the finishing line and uh, finishing the race. That's the challenge to them. <clears throat> and of course, it's the same in many areas of life, I know. I'm not married, but I know married people um, uh, experience something like that also. You know, at the beginning when you get married, it's thrilling, it's exciting, it's exhilarating. There's the honeymoon, the plans, the dreams, the hopes, the ordinary moments, the, the little anniversaries. Waking up in the morning um, with the love of your life lying beside you. But most couples hit the wall at some point. They talk about the seven year itch, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, it can be any time. You hit the wall and uh, the excitement and the romance fades into the distance. It's easy to start strong. Finishing strong is another story. And of course, we're Catholics. Um, and we all have very warm and tender and lovely memories of what it was like um, in the past. The First Communion, the Confirmation, the candles, the incense, and the saints, and all the rest of it. But after a while, many people hit the wall. I think we've all hit a wall at this point. And we've hit a very big wall indeed. Um, we hear about stuff that really just challenges us um, and threatens us and fills us with fear and fills us with um, disappointment and anguish um, and we ask ourselves is it worth it? Is it worth it all? Um, and the things that used to bring joy and peace and happiness um, now just don't seem to do that because our minds keep wandering back to this big wall that we have run into. Well, no matter what race we're talking about, whether it's the New York Marathon or the Tour de France, a marriage, a business, raising children, or the journey of faith itself, the finish is very much determined by the beginning and especially by the preparation that we put into it and the expectations that we bring to the, uh, the endeavor. You finish well by preparing well and by anticipating the journey and the pitfalls and the dangers and the walls that you're going to run into, thinking about them and anticipating them in advance. And in every journey, we go through three phases. There's a honeymoon period, of course, the time of optimism and hope, sometimes naive optimism, indeed, and sometimes naive hope. Then you run into the wall, a time of doubt, a time of pessimism, followed if you hang in there, followed by if you hang in there and you don't hang it up, followed by renewed and lasting hope that accepts reality as it is that accepts a degree of imperfection and challenge as part of the deal and part of the journey and that goes along with the cherished joys and the rewards of being faithful to the journey. So the gospel always asks us, where are you in your journey? Where are you now in your journey of faith? Where are you now in your journey with Christ? in the midst of all the difficult things that we're looking at, experiencing, and facing these days. He bids you to count the cost, to prepare for the difficult days ahead. And I do believe where the church is concerned, there are more difficult days ahead. And there may be many other walls that we will run smack into and we'll have to step back and recover from. 
If you have run into the wall, as we all have these days, if you're stuck with a feeling of despair and a feeling of disappointment because you've become aware of the human face of Christ Church and seen its failures, or seen your own failures, maybe, don't, don't give up. Ask God every day to give you the grace to find a mature faith that can live with the suffering, with the disappointment, with the imperfection, with the doubt, trusting in God in the midst of those difficult things. If Jesus walked in here today and stood up at this microphone, I believe he might well say to you, as he always could, keep your eyes on the finish. Keep your eyes on the finishing line. Don't get completely caught up in the present moment. The present moment may be uphill, may be seemingly impossibly uphill. Your muscles may be weak and aching. Your time may be filled with disappointment and even disgust. Always think about the finish, the finishing line. Keep your focus on the goals ahead and you'll find strength to surmount this wall and every other wall that you're going to run into in the course of your life. That's what he did himself. He fixed his mind on the finish line of faithfulness. So on the cross, the author of the fourth gospel tells us, Jesus could finally utter the words with a certain peace. It is finished. In some ways, of course, it's not important how you finish. It's not important that you come in first in line. Um, you know, when, when you look at the New, York, the New York Marathon or any other marathon on TV, you see that some of the bravest and some of the best and some of the most courageous limp over the finishing line, sometimes being carried by other people, by their friends um, and their, their loved ones. They're marked by pain from the race, but they have the irrepressible smile of a winner as they fall into the arms of those who went before them and who cheer them along the way. Sounds a little like the other finishing line that I'm talking about that lies ahead for each one of us. The line that marks the first few moments of heaven when we get there. Amen.